Hi, welcome to My Comic Crush. I'm Vicki Sebring, and I love comics. So let's dive into a long box and see what we find. With me this week is my co-host, Scott Sebring. Hey there. And today we're going to discuss Red Sonja. Um, I first encountered Red Sonja, um, Red Sonja issue number one in volume three, which was published in August of 1983. Um, the title for that particular issue was While Lovers Embrace Demons Feed. Uh, the stats were editor-in-chief was Jim Shooter, cover artist was Jerry Cachola, inker was Walter Simonson, writer was Tom Del Falco, penciler was Dave Simons, inker was Vince Coletta, colorist was Christy Sheely, letterer was Janice Chang, and editor was Larry Hama. And once again, if I mangled anybody's name, which I probably did, I'm really sorry. What, what first attracted me to this particular issue was the cover, which is just attitude. Um, it's a close-up of Red Sonia's face. She's holding uh, two blades in each hand, and they're kind of crossed. Um, and you see her face underneath her, her hands, and... She's just giving you the 20 yard death stare and she's got this attitude in her lips and it's all don't smurf with me, buddy. You know, it's just bring it. Whatever you want to bring, you bring it. I'm going to send it back to you diced up in little pieces. And, you know, for some reason that appealed to me. I guess I like strong female role models. I don't know, but... It definitely made me pick up the book. And now, I'm a huge sword and sorcery fan. Um, been reading fantasy sword and sorcery books for ever. And so this genre appeals to that part of me. It's not your, your typical superhero comic book. It is very much sort of your fantasy sword and sorcery. Um, in fact, she's based on a character uh, created by Robert E. Howard. He was She's kind of a loosely based on a couple of characters that he created. And he's most known for creating Conan the Barbarian and also Cull. Uh, he's kind of the father of the sword and sorcery genre. Um, but uh, she was loosely based on them, and she was actually her her comic incarnation. The more version of her that most people are familiar was actually created by... Um, uh, Roy Thomas and uh, Barry Windsor Smith. Correct. I mean, they were the ones that really kind of put her into the Conan uh, universe, as it were, the time period, because the other well, two right. characters that... Uh, the, the the characters she was based on by um, Robert E. Howard were not, actually not even in that time period. Uh, I think one was more in the French Revolution. Exactly. And... Uh, what one, one actually carried a pistol. You know, the and the names weren't quite... Uh, they were different a little, I think. The name was s- Mostly similar. Just, yeah, there was like Red Sonia, Ron, Red Sonia or something with like a Y. And, yeah, uh, similar and, and sort of a same attitude. So it's definitely kind of the inspiration she was drawn. Th- but she is definitely a new character that was created by, by Roy and... Um, and Barry Windsor. And so. Barry Windsor Smith. And in her first appearance is uh, actually in Conan, Conan 23... Sounds about right. Conan 23. And that's the, the first time you see her in. Now, most people, iconically, they think of her in, like, the chainmail bikini. Yes. But that's not what she was wearing in her first appearance. She's actually, she is wearing chainmail, but it's more of a chainmail shirt. But you do get the, the core essence of her character there, at least in, under her uh, incarnation in the Marvel Universe. Now, her incarnation currently and the current run of under dynamite is a little different. It's still very. The attitude still. The there. attitude is still the same. Um, there, there are a few. You could say slight but important differences, mainly revolving around celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the key thing in the Marvel universe was that uh, she she made pretty much an oath or a pact. But she pretty much made in the Marvel incarnation. She pretty much had made a, an oath or a pact that uh, she would let no man bed her who had not first honorably defeated her in combat. 
Um, and thus, nobody ever did, as far as I'm aware, not in the Marvel Universe. And that's not even a factor currently in the uh, Dynamite Universe. No, that oath is nowhere to be found in the Dynamite Universe, and, and uh, she's, she's quite straightforward about enjoying a, a nice limber bedmate. <laughs> limber is mentioned repeatedly. Yeah. But back in the Marvel days of the early back 70s. In the, back in the Marvel days, she was very much chaste, shall we say. Not that she didn't enjoy getting her drink on, and not that she didn't enjoy dancing and stuff, but she did not put it out. And as, as a much matter, as Conan tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she played Conan like you wouldn't believe. Especially in the first appearance, she played him. She played him hard. He really thought he was going to get a physical reward for helping her out, but all he got was left in the dust. <laughs> And she is not just an all-around awesome character. I know I, I said we specifically discussed this one issue. I mean, it's a good issue. Don't get me wrong. And for somebody who's a fan of sword and sorcery, it's great. She's a strong, assertive character. She's in charge of an army. She's dealing with wizards and kings and and jerky subordinate men who think that they should be allowed into her pants just because she's a woman, even though she's in charge. And 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 she's taken crap from no one. You know, she's she's strong, she's in charge, and she's getting it done. And I like that, especially in a female character. If you haven't noticed, I like strong female characters. Well, another... Uh Part is, I mean, like you said, this is like volume three of Red Sonja that you're introduced to. This is, yeah, the first issue of volume three. We're into the early 80s. Uh, 83. And she's not even the metal bikini in the, by this point. She's not in the she's not in the classic iconic metal bikini that most people she's think She's kind of like in a her. blue outfit that... Uh, she's Yeah, she's kind of in a, in a blue tunic-y thing. Um, the attitude is still the same. Right, it just seemed like it was a little bit more of a style reboot of sorts. Uh, well, the reboot. The I mean, this is a carryover of a of a style that actually started in Volume Two, which was basically a, just a two issue run, um, where they they put her in this kind of blue outfit, and uh, it, it sort of seemed like that just that particular volume, that particular run of two issues, just sort of died. Like they, I always got the impression, having read it, that there that I, there must be more out there. Uh, of course, I didn't have Wikipedia or Wikis or Googles to find out that, no, there weren't more volumes, more issues in that particular volume. I always just thought I couldn't find them at my comic shop. <laughs> so I looked for a while. But uh, it, it just is sort of an unfinished thought. You get two issues with a story going on there. And there it's definitely a setup for more, but you never get the more. And then it just sort of... When we see her again in Volume Three, um, Issue One, you've you've sort of dropped some elements that were introduced in Volume Two, and if you've read Volume Two, you know which elements I'm talking about. But I'm not going to spoon feed you here. <laughs> Go but, read it. But but pretty much stylistically, costume wise, stylistically, this is where she's it's at. very much similar, very much similar. And as far as the the storyline, it's good, solid sword and sorcery. If you're a fan of the sword and sorcery uh, genre. You're gonna enjoy it. It's a it's a good it's a good read. Um, it does lack a little of the humor, I think, that you see in some of the early stuff with Conan, and uh, especially when Frank Thorne was doing the artwork. There's there are a lot of humorous elements in there that I don't see as much of in her later runs under Marvel. There's some. Don't get me wrong. There's you know there's there is a little bit of a touch of humor, but um, well, I mean, those Frank Thorne runs. I mean, that's my Red Sonia period. Uh, when when you say Red Sonia, that's the visual that I go to. Uh, and for me, Frank Thorne's one of the greats as far as illustrators out there. He definitely had a a beautiful illustrative talent, and that that look is very iconic, especially for her. Now, it wasn't my first exposure to Red Sonia. My first exposure was this Volume Three Issue One with that 
that big cover which drew me in. However, I very quickly went and, and sought out back issues, and so I did get exposed to the Frank Thorne, and I enjoyed those tremendously. She's a great character. She's strong. She's assertive. And I love the, the new Dynamite stuff is really good, um, especially the, is it Gail Simone, um, who is another fabulous writer. I know a lot of people are really excited when they see these strong female characters being handled by, by female writers, especially good female writers. And I agree, it's great to see more diversity uh, entering. And Gail is a fabulous writer, but I think what you just need is a good writer. Chris Claremont does wonderful, strong female characters. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I've, I even heard in an interview Gail herself say that she thinks it's a matter of good writing, not necessarily the sex of the writer. Bingo. If you're a good writer, you could be writing about men, women, aliens, octopuses, you know, canaries well, with attitude. I think that one of the strengths of a good writer is their ability to put themselves in someone else's mindset and try and see the world from a different point of view. Uh, and I think that's what makes a strong writer. And that, like I said, that could be anybody. But that said, Gail is one of the best out there right now. She is just nailing it hard. And I enjoy her work tremendously. I've also really been enjoying the the current Captain Marvel, who was written by Kelly Sue DeConnick, you know, another another really good writer. Um, I mean, it's got Carol Danvers in it, so you're, well, you you're know, on board. <laughs> I'm all about Carol Danvers, uh, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, but apparently I'm not alone. There's a, there's a whole fan group out there called the Carol Corps, but we're getting off topic, so I'm going to swing it back around. Red, Red Sonia is just an awesome character all around, whichever incarnation you're catching her in. Uh, the early work has a lot of great, great art, some really good stories as far as fantasy goes and, and some nice touches of humor. And I think more so in the earlier incarnations, uh, especially with dealing with Conan and Cull and stuff, she really sort of used her sexuality a little more as a, a weapon or a tool, especially the way she played Conan sometimes. That was... <laughs> uh, whereas when you get into these later volumes, volume three with Marvel... She really, you don't see that sort of interplay on her part. She she doesn't dangle herself as a carrot for anybody. She's That's just not how she does it. She's more likely to smack you upside the head for even thinking such a thing. Uh, but it's, it's good, strong fantasy sword and sorcery storylines. Uh, this, this particular volume three, issue one, as I said, you get priest, you get kings, you get subordinates, you get an army, you get a demon, a possessed jewel, a thief. You, you're really kind of covering the, the gamut of, of your potential <laughs> interactions in, in this type of genre. And it's, it's a good read. I mean, it hooked me on the character. It hooked me on the, the series, which was originally intended as just a four-issue limited series. Um, it was produced bi-monthly, but I guess it did well enough that they eventually did turn it into a series. And I think it went as far as, let me see here. It went, it went as far as 13 issues and then it, it died as a lot of, a lot of books do sometimes. Um, but it's, it's been reborn under dynamite and it is going gangbusters there. It's had a phenomenal run, and I think it's it's been uh, relaunched or uh, rebooted, shall we say, uh, since uh, it had an initial very long run, and now it's been rebooted and is in its second run under Dynamite, I think. Second, third, fourth. It's hard to say. The titles change. The titles change a little bit, but it's it's she's definitely worth checking out and getting to know whichever incarnation you want to take her up in. Um, she's strong, she's fun, she's kick butt. I mean, I don't know if so much she was the first, but she was definitely one of the first of badass babe with a blade. Before you had Xena, before you had some of these characters like Dawn and she. She's like the iconic role model for so, she's the template for so many characters who came after. And 
she's still a very vital character today. She she's she still holds up. She holds she's she's aged very well, I have to say. <laughs> I don't know what she's using, but no, she's she's really awesome and I encourage you to get out there and ex- explore her history wherever you want. Um the, the like I said the current stuff under dynamite is awesome. The early stuff in the early Conan and her own books, Marvel features, a lot of good stories there, a lot of really great art. And that that is really where her iconic look comes from, is that, that Frank Thorne art. What some people might not realize about Frank Thorne when he was doing that book was not only was he uh, illustrating it, but he was doing his own inking, he was doing his own lettering, he was doing his own coloring. He was doing it all, other than... Other than the writing. He was pretty and sometimes much, he was throwing in apparently on some of the narrative as well. He was he was pretty much just laying it down, uh, and that's something you don't see nowadays. You just can't. It's too complex nowadays with what all goes in to make a comic. You you will never see those days again. But it is so worth checking out the earlier issues and and seeing his art and those stories. Um, as a matter of fact, I was checking out one of those uh, deluxe artist editions where they show them in the original sizes, and you see kind of what the pen and ink work would be at that time. And if you haven't seen those at your, your local comic book store, I, I do encourage you to take a gander at them if you can find them. They are amazing to look through, well, to fun- see the work. Well, the funny thing is it's also to see the work and sometimes to see the corrections on some of the on some of these uh Words, you know, when when they're printed out, you don't see like the white out and the rework of ink or something like that. And on some artists, there's going to be bits where they revise, like maybe a th- a thought balloon, and they had to white out and re- rewrite the words, or maybe they change the face or expression on a character, and that could be kind of white out or the phrasing. And usually, I could see some of like either the blue pencil that would have been used uh, in Frank's work. There's so little changed. In well, the and the actual also, layout. I mean, when you when see you, it, it's almost like completely intact. Well, and when you look at it, you realize you don't see pencil lines. It's almost like, and maybe he did. Maybe he's good enough that he he just started drawing in ink, whereas most most artists will draw in pencil and, and then, then the come back comes over in. and ink it, um, which makes it easier for corrections and changes and stuff like that. But it it really does. Looking at these these giant books, which are um, reproductions of his original art boards, you may occasionally see bits that have been whited out, but you don't see, at least I didn't see any pencil lines anywhere. And if you look at some of these other books by other artists, you do see that. So it, it really makes you think he just grabbed his his pen or his brush and went to it. Once again, he probably laid down some kind of pencil work on there. Uh, but I do think a chunk of uh, his detail work and stuff was done in the inks. And anyway, it, it just that sometimes when I would see a, a picture that looked like he made an alteration, usually it was an entire face, like maybe, oh, I want a different expression here or something like that. But it was so minimal. I Like I said, it wasn't, uh, wasn't as much as I would see in uh, other editions. And uh, like I said, always very impressed with his work. So that's that's kind of a an overview of of Red Sonia, but in this specific issue, you have her leading the the forces. Her well, they're her men, but they've been hired by the king of this this city, and they're basically collecting the taxes. But primarily, they're also um, harassing a certain priest set for a particular cult, because as far as the king's concerned, these priests are basically stealing the money out of his pocket because people are buying and giving to the cult. They're buying their trinkets, their charms and stuff, and that's money that they should be paying their taxes to the, the king. So he's, he's pretty much hired them to, one, collect his taxes and to kick the priest out whenever they find them, take whatever they have, confiscate any goods, any funds, and give them the, the old heave-ho. Which obviously the the head of the cult and stuff is not too thrilled about, um, and you also in this in this dynamic you have Red Sonia dealing with her men, 
who for the most part respect her leadership. They find her hard but fair. But you do have one or two dweebs who uh, try and challenge her, try and push the boundaries, and also think that because she's a girl, they should be able to take advantage. Um, Of course, she's not going to put up with that crap and uh, puts them in their place. And... Then you also have this this introduction of this mysterious thief who gives Red Sonia this this big honkin' ruby jewel necklace. Um, and she's she's thinking she's going to have to buy it from him. And he's like, just take it, get it away from me, free me. You know, which should have been a little bit of a tip-off, you know, especially since he's covered with all these sores and pustules. But for whatever reason, she just well, Red doesn't Sonya notice. Well, Red Sonia and a lot of the barbarians of that period were easily distracted by shiny objects. Easily distracted by shiny objects. And in her defense, it was enchanted. So it was probably working some mojo on her to make her not probably care Probably some glamour so going on there. So she takes this this jewel and she's she's got it. And she and her men are in the tavern and they're, they're celebrating their latest success of gathering the 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 taxes and rousting these priests and renegotiating their deal with the king to get a, a better payout. Um, so they're all feeling happy and drinking it hard. And uh, the the a subset of the priests led by one of their buttheads, because every every group's got its buttheads, let's face it. They come running into the tavern intent to break heads and and teach Red Sonia men Red Sonia's guys who's who. Uh, well, Red, they come barreling in, and Red Sonja's like, grab your weapons, let's teach them what's what, and all her guys are pretty much drunk and keeling over and totally no good. So it's basically Red Sonja against all these priests, and the priests are just flailing about and beating the tar out of all her drunk dudes, um, and she's overpowered really fast. But she's got this necklace, and suddenly, boiling out of this necklace comes this giant, ugly demon from wherever, that just starts chomping up on the priest. You know, big scales, teeth, claws. The priest didn't have a chance. Um, make short work of them. The, what, what it doesn't destroy, it uh, sends running, for fleeing for their lives. And, Red so- you know, Red Sonia's good with this. She's like, this is magic I can get behind. You know, this is awesome. And she quickly starts incorporating this this demon, uh, now that she's figured out how to summon it and work it, into her normal duties to help the speed the pay up from the peasants, you know? Uh, a, little, a little demon appearance goes a long way to emptying those pockets. Very persuasive. Very persuasive. And the king is all for it because he's getting a lot more money because she's able to squeeze a lot more out of him. However, the... The head priest who hears about what's going on realizes that this is a dangerous situation. You know, a smart person doesn't bleed their populace to the point where their populace is so desperate because that's rife for rebellion. And he also knows that this is going to make the king, who's a bit of a putz, go figure, um, the king is probably going to come for for the, the, the priesthood, the religious sect. And as a matter of fact, the king has hired Red Sonia and told her to gather her men and we'll get an army together and let's go wipe these little buggers out. And that's what they do. Now, while all this is going off, in her dreams, she is being seduced by this dream lover who just keeps trying to seduce her. Now, granted, he's not making a lot of headway, at least not as far as the physical stuff goes. He may be making a little headway on her emotionally. Um making her feel like he really does love her and that, you know, but he, he never really manages to seal the deal. Shall we say, um, she always manages to wake up before things get too hot and heavy as far as the physical stuff goes. Anyways, this has been all going on in the background and that we're at the point now where we are attacking the priesthood. She's at the head of her army. She's got her demon dude. And the priest has been hearing about this demon and he's researched it. He knows what the jewel is. He knows what's going on. And he has instructed his priest to fight them with the aspect and the intention of delaying them as long as possible while he is working a spell. And so they're basically just 
throwing themselves at these guys, cannon fodder, uh, just doing anything they can to slow them down so that by the time Red Sonia and the king actually reach the priest, and the priest himself d- does some magic and stuff to help slow them down with some some statues. It's, it's pretty cool. Read the, you know, read the issue, find out. <laughs> um, by the time they actually get there, he has managed to work the spell. And what the spell was, was basically removing the glamour that the the necklace had thrown over Sonia so that she could see one that she is covered now in all these sores and stuff that the original thief had. But two, that this demon that she's been summoning is also the dream lover who's been stalking her in her dreams. And as the priest points out, he's not stalking you because he loves you. He wants you to replace him in the gem. The gem requires a living soul and he's trapped in it, and he's trying to get you in there and him out. And she realizes this, and the demon is basically laughing at her, because what's she going to do? She's already well entrapped. And he basically thinks that she's fallen into a, a despair and is contemplating killing herself, but that's not Red Sonia. So she's basically kind of sitting there. She's looking at her dagger. And like I said, he thinks she's in despair and is contemplating killing herself, which is making him laugh because that won't save her at this point. Her soul is too snared. But no, what she does is she reverses the dagger and she starts pounding on the gem with the hilt. Um, And when he realizes what she's doing, he tries to interfere, but it's too late. She basically, she breaks the gem. There's a bit of an explosion. The... The magic spell is undone. She's free, but she's knocked out. When she comes to, the priest and the king have come to an agreement. They're going to work together and split the profits. And she sees the writing on the wall and heads out of town. And that's pretty much where we end this initial issue. Um, we, we pick up with her. The, la- the very last we see of her is um, she's been traveling through the desert and she comes across some water and she drinks the water heavily without really checking it. And once she st- has eased her thirst enough, she realizes that the water's tainted. It's full of dead things and that maybe drinking it wasn't the best move. Wasn't there somebody like you try to warn her not to drink it? Or? Well, her horse didn't want any of it, but she didn't listen to the That's horse. That's what they call horse sense. Yeah, horse sense. His Pay- horse sense was tingling. His horse sense was tingling. But that's the last we hear of his superhero abilities. And that's also where the where the issue ends. And then, uh, like I said, it is the, uh, they do pick up her story in the, the coming issues. You know, this is one of those, those rare comics where I can tell you exactly where I first encountered it. Um, which was on, at the Eckerd's on 13th Street in Lubbock, Texas. In the little spindle rack. There it was. And the cover just, wham, reached out and socked me, and I picked it up. And then I very shortly went looking for back issues at, at Star, my local comic book store, which you've heard me talk about before if you've listened listened to previous episodes. Um, and that's where I, I discovered the the stuff with Conan and the Frank Thorne and the, the weird two-issue volume two, which had me confused for a long time. And st- I still find it a little confusing. It's just kind of odd. And and that's that's really where my my love of this character comes comes through. Now this this is a perfectly fine initial introduction. It's a good story for the genre. It is. It may not be her best ever story, but it's it's a great intro to the character. You get the core of who she is. Now, was this before the movie? This was before the movie. I yes. Oh, 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 the movie. Oh, ow. So you actually saw it. I, as a Red Sonia fan, I, I was a movie. They're doing a movie. Oh my God, they're doing a movie. I'm so happy. I'm so excited. I'm going to the movie. I'm seeing the movie. Oh, this is crap. Um, it's a. Don't read the comic. Don't see the movie, unless you're unless you're seeing it as a drinking game or something like that. I don't recommend this this movie uh, or Mystery Science Theater three thousand. Do it as a Mystery Science Theater three thousand. That might could be fun, but 
if you're expecting to get some good Red Sonja in that film, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, Arnold even kind of... <laughs> even Arnold thought it was bad. I mean, come on. It, it, it wasn't what I had hoped for. It wasn't what I was expecting. And yes, I was, I was very disappointed. And I do try and cut movies especially comic book movies, I do try and cut them some slack. I I know you, you're giving my, he is giving me this look like, oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. I understand the difficulties of trying to translate. Let, 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 me, let me qualify that a little bit as I'm <laughs> laughing over here. Uh, you cut comic book movies slack. Up when to a point. When they're not messing with, your stories that you love, your characters that you love. Okay, I'll you, give you, you can, that. You, you can play around <laughs> with, you know, Daredevil and, okay, maybe a little bit with Captain America and maybe some Spider-Man, but your X-Men? Don't mess with my X-Men, baby. Don't your Red mess Sonya? with my X-Men. Don't, don't mess with, yeah, okay, maybe I don't cut him, cut him that much slack and... And you will find out exactly how little slack I do cut them when we eventually do discuss some of those stories. A few of the the better known stories that have been attempted to be converted into film. Um, so yeah, that, that's for another time. <laughs> that is definitely for another time because that's a rant that will take quite a while. Yeah, okay, maybe I don't cut them as much slack as I think I do, but. I do try to cut them a little. Well, it's just I was thinking that uh, when you were talking about, you know, how you were first introduced to Red Sonja, a uh, quick little, or maybe not so quick, little aside of where my first exposure to her was, was, uh, like I said, back in the 70s, about mid-70s, uh, I was collecting Slurpee cups. <laughs> uh, hey, kids Collectible Slurpee cups. Hey, around that particular period... Hey, I, was, I can't talk. A, I got. I've. I've got Pizza Hut cups. I understand. Yeah. So the Slurpee cups. Uh, DC did a run of them. You get. You know. Here's the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and so forth, with some great illustrations on them from back in the day. You know, collect them all. And Marvel was doing their run, and uh, there was also a little checkoff sheet that you could get, a little little uh, black and white printout that gave you uh, the rundown of all the different cups to collect over time. I got a lot of brain freeze buying a lot of slurp Slurpees back then. Now, I prided myself in thinking, like, I know the Marvel Universe. You know, my probably about 10, maybe 11 years old here going like, yeah, I know the Marvel Universe here. I got it. Yeah, there's Captain America. There's the thing. There's the Human Torch. Hey, there's that angel from the X-Men. I, I knew all those. And I'm, like, checking. And I even knew who Conan was. But on my checkoff list, there's this Red Sonja. And I think I said Red Sonja. Back then, because it had a J in it, and I'm like, "What the hell is this? I don't, I don't know this one. This is one that went past my radar." Then I saw the cup in the metal bikini, and as I was about ten or eleven, that wasn't missed on me. I became a big fan <laughs> uh, real quick. Uh, but yeah, that was my first exposure to Red Sonia was a Slurpee cup. Oh, yeah, certain forms of marketing do work. They are effective. That's why they continue to be used. Uh, yeah, that was in the days before the big gulp. In the days before the big gulp, yes. So so your first exposure to Red Sonja was a Slurpee cup. Mine was this particular cover, which is an awesome cover, I, I got to say. It's not it's not the Frank Thorne, but it is. it just gives you her attitude for days. Um, check the website out so you can see, see exactly what I'm talking about because um, it will be up there. And we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I do hope you'll really, really check out this particular character, Red Sonja. Like I said, her her new stuff, her current run on Dynamite is awesome. And you can go to the shelves, go to your local store or wherever, and, and even download and, and hop right into her current run. And I don't think you will be disappointed. It's good stuff. But if you want to check out the older stuff, the stuff I started with and, and the stuff that I loved and that first made me love this character, I, I encourage that tremendously. There's a lot of good stuff back there. And until next time, I'm Vicki Sebring. And I'm Scott Sebring. And this has been My Comic Crush. <laughs>
My Comic Crush is a production of Sebring Arts, executive producers Vicki Sebring and Scott Sebring, sound production and theme music by Scott Sebring, special guest provided by Blackmail and Shameless Baking. For more episodes in this series, you can visit our website at mycomiccrush.com or find us on iTunes, Podcast Republic, or wherever fine podcasts can be found. That's all for now, so go out and read something. 